Okay, tonight we're gonna, you're gonna hear me use this term a lot. Um, um, I've shared it with the staff um, this week at our staff meeting. I'm just gonna read this to you. The term is called an unanxious presence. Okay, an unanxious presence. And um, what I try to do is um, twice a month, we extend our staff meetings a little bit longer, and, and I've been taking a the theme through various books, just kind of building up on our spiritual leadership, team building skills. And um, I stumbled across this article, and I thought it'd be interesting to share with you, especially in light of what we're going to learn tonight. So you mind if I read this to you? Is it okay? All right. Unanxious Presence. Um, Edwin Friedman, author of Generation to Generation, Family Process and Church and Synagogue, characterizes a leader, here it is, as an unanxious presence. Okay? While I believe that there is more to leadership than this, bringing, uh, being this unanxious presence is no small feat. Amen? To not be anxious? To live up to this characterization, the leader has to have a great deal of composure. She or he has to be able to remain calm in the midst of crisis, think clearly, logically, expansively, and without prejudice. Leaders model the behaviors they expect from others. Whether this is composure, courage, flexibility, or resilience, leaders establish the personal standards for everyone else, right? It's not so different in what this guy Dave Grossman talks about in his military and law enforcement programs. And it goes on to say that this guy has talked about the psychology of what happens when you're in battle. He says, in battle, if you lose control of yourself, your emotions are raging, your heart is pounding, the blood flow to your brain becomes constricted, then you cannot think as clearly as you could if you maintain control of yourself. Now think about it, if you're in a firefight on the battlefield, it could, could cost you your life and the lives of the people that you're fighting with. You can read more about this, and then he gives some articles that don't worry about that. But he also did an interesting thing. He began to study and, um, the repeated occurrence of children killing others. Have you noticed in the news lately, we've been seeing some of that. There's been a lot of child crimes and kids turning, and all of a sudden, you know, you got four-year-olds doing this and six-year-olds and going, what the heck is going on? And they talked about an, an exceedingly violent generation where because of, we're so enamored with it and it's so there and the frequency of things, whether you get it on TV or, you know, you get it um, in different forms of media. And, and I'm not going to diss video games, but, you know, some of the games, they get pretty intense. But even in toning down of language and what's norm, what was just really wrong a decade ago or two decades ago is a laughing norm on television and even a speaking norm now right? And we have our grandparents going, what's going on? How can you talk like that? And it's just like, well, everybody does. And, you know, we've come to the thing that it's not a matter if, if it's right, but relatively, hear me when I say this, relatively, if everybody believes it, then it must be true. Versus what we learn in the Bible, which is what? Absolute truth. Right? So back to this thing. Every leader is forced to function outside of their comfort zone. The stresses, the conflicts, the demands, the deadlines, the contradictory expectations, the personal personality differences, and more contribute to an environment of disequilibrium, right? A lot of stuff goes in, right? If the leader can't maintain his balance, then the group, the team, the organization, the community, the nation, the planet can't either. And to ma maintain this balance requires a leader to recognize her own limitations, accept them and work with them. In essence, you staff to your weakness. You, you build a team based on not just people like you, but people that are not like you as well. If you don't think you have any weaknesses, then you are living in a fantasy world, living a lie, and is setting up yourself and everyone else for failure. As we get into the word tonight, we're gonna, it's interesting because it begins the life of the last judge of the book of Judges, Samson, but it starts with his parents. So with your permission, we're not really going to talk about Samson tonight because we will in the next couple weeks, but this is an incredible story of God seeing people in a very dark time. All right, so let's look at this. Judges 13.1. Now the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, so that the Lord gave them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. Now a couple things for those of you that are taking notes. Um, remember, we went over the pattern of judges. Go ahead and put that up on the screen, right? The people do evil in the sight of the Lord. Remember this? Then what does God do? He hands them over to a, a, a nation or some to oppress them. 
then what do the people do? The people cry out to Yahweh. He raises up a deliverer. The oppressor is defeated, and the people have rest. Okay, so this is the pattern in the book of Judges. But I want you to notice something. Let me take this out so I can walk over here for a second. Notice here, and I love y'all way over there. I love you tons, okay, but I got to walk over here. Okay, notice that the first thing that we see is that in this story, when it deals with Samson, you're going to begin to see a change in what's going on. The first change is that when we read what is going on with the people around Samson's time, no one in the Bible doesn't record anybody calling out for help or crying out to the Lord. Isn't that well? Every other story has the people, then the people cried out and God did this. But look at the scripture carefully. No one cries out. Now I'm hoping it's because the guy who's writing it didn't know. But we're believing that God is the, or, the author of everything in it. There's a point at the place where the people are being oppressed and they don't cry out to God. Isn't that wild? They don't cry out to God. So that's one of the things that is different as we're going to look at the life of Samson. The other thing is that the oppressor is going to take 100 years to be defeated. For those of you, again, taking notes, this begins the deliverance when we see the life of Samson. But write down 2 Samuel chapter 5 because that's when the Philistines are finally defeated. When David defeats the Philistines and he gets back the Ark of the Covenant, right? Remember in chapter 6, he dances his way into Jerusalem, right? So it's going to take a hundred years for this to happen. Then finally, the last thing here that we look at um, is that for the next hundred years, number six, there is no rest in the nation of Israel. Okay, now, when you hear that, that's just dramatically sad when you think about what's going on. But the hope of God is in the midst of a pattern that nobody's crying out to the Lord, the great news is, is that actually there are some people that are, but it's not collectively as a nation, but we find a married couple calling out in the name of the Lord. And this is so cool. Verse 2. There was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Danites whose name was Manoah. Right on. And his wife was barren and had borne no children. Now for all you Hawaiians, you're going, all right, that's not. Manoah's name, though, means rest and quiet, and that's going to come into play later in the story. A couple just tidbits, again, for you guys who like to know this stuff. Zorah is a child of the tribe of Dan, and it's right on the border of the Philistine um, land, which if you, for those of you that like to look at maps, there's none up there. Um, the land of, go ahead, look up. Map. None. Um, but the land of the Philistines is in mo the modern-day place in Israel um, right outside called the Gaza Strip. Okay, Gaza is on the, um, what is it? Yeah, right on the Mediterranean on the west side. You know, there's, it's the Med and then Gaza and then Israel's all the way around it. So that's the land of the Philistines. And so what's interesting about this town is that, um, and we're going to learn that um, everybody is fleeing it because they're afraid of the Philistines, but this couple stays there because somehow they feel like God wants them there. Isn't that well? Anyway, so um, the, now the tribe of Dan, again, look at the scripture up on the screen because Dan was destined for greatness. Genesis 49, 16, 18 says this. And you remember at the end of Genesis, Jacob blesses his sons, right? And he prophetically speaks about their future each one of them. He speaks into their future. And this is what he says about Dan. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. And here's the prophetic push, like their destiny as a, as a people. Dan shall be a serpent in the way, a horned snake in the path that bites the horse's heels. That's pretty awesome considering Dan was the smallest tribe, and yet it was saying size does not matter because if you live to who you are, you will make a huge difference. You will nip at, bite at, you will have um, a sizable impact on what is going on. For your salvation, I wait, O Lord. The sad thing when you study the tribe of Dan going into and through the book of Judges is they pretty much phase out. Again, you note-takers, write this down. In Judges 1.34, they fail to take the valleys. The, the, um, the, the Ammonites, what is it? The Amorites drive them into the hills, and they freak. And then the, they, the leaders say, let's go back down. And it says, no, 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 we're fine with the hills. So they give up their land to the Amorites, and they don't take back the valleys. Then later on in chapter 5 of Judges, it says that they they're metaphorically say that Dan always stayed on its ship. It never came to shore to help. And so that was the legacy of Dan 
And it's radical when we think about it because Samson is of the tribe of the Dan's and he has an opportunity. And again, we'll start that next week. So the idea is Dan was destined to be a mighty warrior. We see that prophetic promise there, but they didn't live up to it. Finally, Manoah and his wife, who is never named, we don't know Manoah's wife's name, but she is kicking. When you see at the end, it's incredible because she is just an awesome woman of God. They, um, she was barren, and we know culturally when someone was barren that they were frowned upon, they were considered cursed by God, which she was not, but it, was, it had become part of the folklore of the culture, and people were instantly labeled because of that. And so it's evil, it's bad, the Philistines are across the hill, but they stay where they are, and that's significant, okay? And in the midst of this, and I want you to catch this, look up on the screen again, Psalm 91, verses 14 to 16. And I love this scripture, because in the midst of living in a dark place, if you are obediently living in a place and you're going, why, God, do you have me here? Enjoy this psalm. The word says, because he has loved me, and you and I are the he. Because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high, because he has known my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With a long life, I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. Manon and his wife, sensing that God is large and in charge, stay. People are leaving the town, but they get this sense that the Lord wants them there. And it's intimated in the Hebrew language. They take root where they are, believing God wants them there. And no one, they don't test the wind to say, wow, what is everybody else doing? No, God, what do you want me to do? This is what I'm doing. Okay, so this is the character of this couple that would parent Samson. Verse 3. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold now, you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and give birth to a son. That's pretty heavy. Now therefore, be careful not to drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. For behold, you shall conceive and give birth to a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For the boy shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Now that's a heavy story. It reminds you of somebody else in the Bible, doesn't it? Who else had this uh, wonderful scene from an angel? Mary. Well, let me tell you my story, which is pretty wild. In um, 1992, the Lord has spoken to Brenda and I when I was on staff at Hope Kaneohe that we were to go out and plant Hope Chapel Kapolei. So Pastor Ralph was very generous, and we made the announcement. We had a core team of about 45, 50 that were getting ready to go out with us. So once a month, we would have a potluck. And of course, um, we were different. Instead of midweek, we had mini churches. So we began to start a network of mini churches. And we began to build the church one year in advance with small groups. Well, it was a couple months before the church started. I remember it was the summer of 1993. And I was sitting there praying with the group. And I don't know if you ever felt this, but you know, you're praying. And, and, and all of a sudden, I had this thought come in me. But I didn't want to say it. You know, it's one of those things, cause, and all I was thinking of, let me, well, let me backtrack. There was a couple in there that was trying to get pregnant for years. And they had spent thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. And while we're praying, we're worshiping, and people are blessing one another, I feel like the Lord says, tell them I'm going to give them a baby in a year. And I, right away I go, there is no way on your earth that I'm going to do this. You know, because I want it to be God. I mean, don't, wouldn't you want that to be God? I mean, think about it. Wouldn't you want that to be? Of course you do. But it's scary because you speak out because it's not really about God. It's not even about them. It's always about what if I'm wrong, right? It's always I and me. And so I'm feeling this at the beginning of the study, and great, I have to teach. So we're going through this discussion. I'm doing this, and we're doing worship, and my stomach's going like this, and I just feel it. You know, I'm just getting like abs of steel. Now I have an ob, but I used to have an ab. And so I'm just going nuts. And so the group's about to go, and, 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 and God doesn't scream at you, but I just felt like the Lord was saying, say it. Just come on, trust me, say it. So finally I look at this couple, and I said, just, you know what, I don't know if this is the Lord. And I'm sweating. I'm dying. And I said, but I just want to tell you, I, I just couldn't help but thinking that within a year, God wants to give you a baby. And you could have dropped a pin in the room. 
he gives me the stinkiest look. Good thing I'm bigger than him, you know, but he want, I could tell this guy's going to knock me out. He just looked at me with stink look. She looked at me and ran out of the room crying. And I'm like, great. They wouldn't, you know, and they're really upset, and then people are kind of doing their thing. They're kind of like, hi. And they, you know, it's like you're in a room, and all of a sudden, nobody wants to talk to you. <laughs> and I'm the pastor, <laughs> right? But all of a sudden, he's going to, oh, hi, Pastor Don. <laughs> Well, got to go. And everybody's just avoiding me. And everywhere I went, groups are partying. And finally, the man grabs me on the side and he goes, Hey, John, let me just tell you what's going on. Just last night, my wife and I came to a peaceful place of saying, You know what, Lord? We just release this to you. And we're not going to try anymore. And we just, we just, you know what, Lord? We just accept where we're at in life. And you know what? Just like we're just not praying about this. And we, ha- we just came to a place of perfect peace about this whole thing. And you ruined it. So I'm great, but they still wanted to plant the church with me. He was my main setup guy, and she was just awesome. So it was really terrible until four months later when she found out she was a month pregnant. It was incredible. And one year later, I, I, I still to this day don't know what her name is because I call her Isaac, which means laughter, and she's 19 years old now. Now, I'm not going to sit here. Don't come up after and say, so what's God got for me? I don't know. (laughs) And especially you ladies, don't ask me this because your husbands, I'm a lot older, man. I can't take guys down the way I used to, okay? So I don't know stink eyes. And some of you girls are pretty scary too. (laughs) But what blows me away in this story is that you have a couple, when you study them, they're isolated. There is no priestly influence in their life. It's just the two of them, okay? And God sees them, and he loves them so much that he sends an angel of the Lord, and we're going to learn later in the scripture that it is God himself, a theophany or Christophany, whatever you want to call it. But God comes into the flesh because he loves these people so so much, and I want you to catch that. Because some of you feel like your life is this close to the land of the Philistines. And you feel so isolated in the midst of things. You can be in this room and be the loneliest person on the planet because of something that has happened, something that is a part of you that you say, I will not open my heart to another person. And at night, when no one's around, you are scared to death because of the Philistines. Do you hear what I'm saying? And you're crying out to God and you don't know what's going on. The great news is, is God saw them and God sees you. And God just doesn't want to see you. He wants to bless you. Okay? Now there's work to be done, but he tells this woman that that she's going to have a promise of a son, but she says this. Now you note takers, a couple things for you. You read this later, but this is good stuff. If you want to study what a Nazarite is, the, the uh, place in the Bible is Numbers. Numbers chapter 6. That's where you find all the information that you want to about the Nazarite vow. But let me give you a couple things here real quick. A Nazarite usually was either a male or a female that was wholly consecrated unto the Lord. Usually it was seasonal, right? And we read a lot of seasonal guys. Even Paul in the book of Acts was a seasonal Nazarite. There were three people in the Bible that committed the Nazarite vow for life. Now, Samson is one. Can you think of the other two? John the Baptist, right, in the New Testament. There's one guy in the Old. Very good. I was going to say, don't make me spell it out, you know. It's just like, because, again, I'm, I'm going to be 51. It hurts when I do that now. But when I was 25, I was awesome. But um, Samuel, Samuel's the other guy. Okay, so it was Samuel, and the reference is the signatures, 1 Samuel chapter 1, if you want to read about Samuel's call to a lifetime of being a Nazarite. John the Baptist is Luke 115. All right? Now, number six, just a couple things for you when we're studying Nazarites, and we're going to get to the rest of the scripture in a moment. There were three primary things that they outwardly did that would show the public that they were a Nazarite. They wouldn't drink anything of the vine or anything intoxicating, right, for their season, or in the case of those three, for a lifetime, right? So, and the whole adage of this is symbolized, don't get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit, right? Don't be powered by anything of the world. I'm powered by the power of the Holy Spirit. They weren't allowed to touch dead bodies. 
And, and that was a statement of their life committed to holiness. I am consecrated to being holy, set apart, and I'll touch no unclean thing. The third thing was they had long kicking hair. Okay, long hair. Now, it was cool. I, I remember, you know, people were, Mike was seizing me last week. Yes, I did. I, it was down to my back, and, you know, it's just like I'm so done with that. You know, it's just like, but the hair was an outward sign of their commitment as well. The hair for women is, the Bible says what? It's a covering, right? But for men in this time, remember, it was a heavy male time. But, so when men had long hair, it was a crown of glory. Right? And so they would wear this crown and it would be a testament. So people would see outward signs on these men or women that they had dedicated and they had changed their life. So it was visible. It was a visible thing. People would say, whoa, that's a Nazarite. They live for God. Isn't that cool? So the thing is they had to live up to what their physical adornment was. Now the sad thing is we've learned it doesn't matter. Jesus said people got into the place where they always did what with the outside of the club? They were cleaning it. They were dressing it up, making it look nice. But inside was crud, right? And so when the Lord came, they had taken this wonderful thing of this call, and everybody was looking fine, but nobody was living right. Do you catch that? So the Nazarite vow was something when it started. Read number six. It's really incredibly powerful. So it meant that you consecrated yourself to God. Negatively, you renounced everything of the world. I will not partake in anything that is considered unclean. So you made a statement. Now, some people take this to an extreme, and we see religious... What is that? Religious. That's a hard word. Religious groups that they don't want to... Whether it's they want to live a life where they're not using any modern conveniences. So some, um, in my day, you know, there was whether or not you could go dancing, or, you know, it's just like... I know we always make a big deal about shorts, but I, I got I to let you know there's a, a lot of churches where people dressing isn't a big deal anymore. But there was a time when it was. I remember, and this will date me some, I remember when we made the transition from the organ to the guitar. That was pretty heavy. That was pretty heavy back then. And um, it's just like, and the radical thing is, um, a lot of the guys are saying that when we went into music, that was really cool. When we got into rock and roll and all kinds of stuff, that was heavy. And, um, but there's a radical move to go back to old hymns again by young people. There's churches on, on the West Coast that they're all about hymns and candles and just um, religious settings and stained glass and everything. I'm going, wow, that reminds me when I was a kid, but it's kind of cyclic, right? But everybody's looking for that thing that invites and just communicates, you know, that God is in his place. This is holy. So that's what the Nazarites did. Positively, again, somebody could look at them and say that they're distinct, Right? In 1 Peter 2, it says what? Live such good lives among the pagans that they what? See your good deeds and give glory to God on the day that he emerges, right? Let your light shine before men, right? So we're called to do this. So it ties into where we are. So we're called to be three things in this, sanctified, set apart, and holy, right? Let's keep reading. Verses 6 and 7. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came to me, and his appearance was like the appearance of, of the angel of God. And look at how she describes it. Very awesome. And I did not ask him where he came from, nor did he tell me his name. Now, that's, that's a lady, because guy would, that's the details we want to know, right? My wife and I always get into it, and I go, Wow, what was going on? Who is there? She goes, I don't know. I said, what was going on? She goes, I don't know. And I, and I go, and because the thing is, she was going around and talking to her lady friends. My wife, she likes to latch on. She'll talk to one person, and they kind of hook up and disappear in the corner of the room. Now, I'm, I'm the kind of guy, I'm social butterfly. How's it going? What's happening? How's it going? Da, 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 touch, 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 hug, 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 kiss, kiss, kiss. What's happening? Right? And I love just, you know, just if I could just hug all of you before you go, I would. Okay? So if you haven't caught me, catch me. I'll catch you by the door. But the idea is, is that, and I didn't understand this, and I just want to point it out to you, and I'm not going to elaborate on this because there's other things, but I just think it's interesting in the scripture, in the second part of 6, that she didn't ask him where he came from, nor did he tell me his name. Why is it interesting? Because there's something intuitive going on because she knows this man is awesome. Do you see that word? In, um, oh, oh you, I'm sorry, it's not up there. You see it in your scripture. You see that word? Um, in verse 6, the idea is that when she's in the Hebrew, the word awesome is someone that is larger than life. 
Okay, so so when she uses this word, she's saying, I saw somebody, and you know what? He's beyond, you know, there's something about this guy. And then what does she say? She goes, a man of God. And then she goes, no, an angel of God. She goes, "I, I can't, something, something. Dear ones, and I just want to give you permission. Don't make light when you sense that something bigger than you is going on. Now, let's, we're not going to chase after all this stuff, but at the same time, don't be afraid because what they do is very biblical. When she brings this report, she goes to her husband, tells him this thing, and look at what happens. Verse 8, Then Manoah entreated the Lord. What does that mean? He prayed. Wife is close enough to her husband where she says, Honey, something happened. I think this is a God thing. He hears the news. What does he do? He falls to his knees. He, he prays and says, Oh, Lord, please let the man of God whom you have sent come to us again. Nothing wrong with that. God is not offended when you say, Lord, is this really you? We, we put these things on God. Like, it's just like, and we forget that a great parent just is a great repeater. A great boss is a great repeater, right? Sometimes we're annoyed, but that's because we're on this side of heaven. God is a great God. He doesn't understand annoy. He says, baby, what, you didn't hear me? I'll tell you one more time. So would you come again that he may teach us what to do for the boy who is to be born? Now, that's an incredible statement of faith. Did you catch it? He doesn't say, come and clarify and confirm the message. He says, wow, God, you're giving me a son? Could you come again? Because I want to know what to do. And don't let that miss. And it's just like, that's an incredible faith. It's a statement of this couple. Remember, all by themselves, isolated, Philistines all around. Something happens. The wife goes, honey, I think it's a God thing. And he goes, whoa, let's bring him back because I want to get the instructions on how to do this. That is so cool. That is so cool. Verse 9, God listened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again to the woman as she was sitting in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. So the woman ran quickly and told her husband, Behold! Does anybody talk like that, by the way? Huh? You do, Eli. Whenever you do it, you are. Behold, I am here to cut your grass. <laughs> and behold, the worm hath come. I must bring the fertilizer. Yes. I, you know, I, I totally believe you. The worm hath come. Where am I? So the woman ran quickly and told her husband, Behold, the man who came the other day has appeared to me. Then Manoah arose and followed his wife. And when he came to the man, he said to him, and, and this is good, but only the Bible says, Are you the man who spoke to the woman? And he said, I am. Then verse 12 is like one of the coolest verses of this, of this chapter. It's so awesome. Manoah said, now, when your words come to pass, do you see the confidence? He doesn't go, really? Really? I mean, come on. No, he says, when your words come to pass, what shall be the boy's mode of life and his vocation? Typical man questions, right? Okay, when he gets here, okay, what's my instructions? Because where are you taking him, and what will he be doing? What is his career path? Right? Right? At least that's, you know, how I would ask. So the angel of the Lord, notice what he says and does not say in verse 13. So the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, let the woman pay attention to all that I said. She should not eat anything that comes from the vine, nor drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. Let her observe all that I commanded. Now, God doesn't like walk away and go, psych, I didn't tell him. He's not like that. But he didn't tell him. What he says is he affirms, what, he affirms what the wife heard because she from before from the womb is carrying a judge of Israel that will be walking in the power of God. And so she is the one who's going to change her ways. She is called to do all these things. He is called to cover her with love and respect and honor what God has said for her to do. You hear what I'm saying? And so he says, you know, I want you to focus. He goes, you have, you have questions, and he doesn't say this, but God intimates, he goes, sometimes I just don't answer your questions. I know we have good questions sometimes when we're struggling with God, and God, he loves us, but he is not obliged to answer everything that we ask him. 
And right there, dear ones, is the intersection of where we serve him and where we also offer lordship to him, right? Because, you know, we say a lot of wonderful things. He is large and in charge and he's all these things. But where are you at when he says not now or probably not? Or you know what, let's move on. Is he still large and in charge? But a little bit annoying. You understand? Be careful, dear ones. Confess that out quickly. So Manoah learns a lesson, and, and he says, you know what, I spoke to your wife, you back up your wife right now. So what does God call them to be? He says, just be great parents. Incredible, yeah? Judges, verse 15. Then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, please let us detain you so that we may prepare a young goat for you. And that's just an offer of hospitality now. The angel of the Lord said to Manoah, though you detain me, I will not eat your food. I love this. But if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to the Lord. Underline that because we're going to talk about that in a moment. For Manoah did not know that he was the angel of the Lord. He still doesn't know. He just thinks he's a godly man. And he goes, you know what? I want a Bedouin I'm custom. I want to make you a big feast because, man, you brought great news to our family. And this is such a dark place. And it's so nice to have another brother that loves God here. Right? Manoah said to the angel, what is your name? So that when your words come to pass, we may honor you. Again, thinking as a man, we want to tell the story. Because, you know, storytelling. We want to talk about the man who came and brought the great news from God. But the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing that it is wonderful? It's interesting, that verse I told you to write, because there's, there's a strong intimation here. A burnt offering. The, sim, the symbol, let me give you the scripture, then again, look at it later, but let me kind of paraphrase what it says. Luke 6, Luke 6 verses 8 to 13. What does a burnt offering symbolize? Well, think about it. It is something that is wholly devoted to God. Unlike the other offerings where you put it on, take it off, you take the fat of this or that. When you put it on, you put it on. It's 100% God's. There's nothing left. It's holy unto God. And let the Holy Spirit grab your heart at that. It is wholly consecrated unto God. Okay? When you read the scripture and, the, and the, their attachments, when you go to Leviticus, it'll take you to some cross-references. But basically it says, uh, a burnt offering is based on an imitation of a covenant of grace with God. That means you and God are in good standing. It's a privilege to give a burnt offering based on a good relationship. Isn't that wild? You think, wow, you're giving a lot. No, it's a privilege to give a burnt offering to God. And it's assuming that you and God are on good terms. Third element of a burnt offering. It depends on righteous standing before God as well. Isn't that heavy? I think I got this. Um, just do I have it on the screen? Romans 12? Yeah. Look on the screen. Remind you of something? Let me go over here. Read to my friends over here in the cheap seats. Sorry, but you know. Over there. You guys look over here. I'll read to them. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, what? A living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Isn't that wild? In some versions, it says, it says, wholly devoted to God. In a sense, a burnt offering. With the twist, it's a living thing. One of the things I've been praying about that is just blowing my mind is the sheer number of suicides that we've been exposed to in the last four weeks in our nation. What the heck is going on? Suicide is not a natural human thought. People made in the image and likeness of God do not intuitively think of taking their life. It is something that is demonic. It's based on being in dark places. It's based on isolation and a bunch of heinous things wrapped around idolatry that have to do with devaluing human life. And when you think about it, what I've been doing, every time I saw it, I just began to pray for families, pray for young people, and said, Lord, just, we just stand against this as the body of Christ in Jesus' name. You pull a Gandalf on behalf of others and say, that's it. And you celebrate life. 
It's the privilege of being a Christian and dwelt by the presence of God. And do not be conformed to this world, it says in Romans 12, verse 2, but be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So in a sense, this is our version of being a burnt offering, holy and pleasing to the Lord. And because of Christ, dear ones, you have the privilege. Romans 5 says what? One, you have peace with God. Romans 8, 1 says that you're not condemned. And I say these again and again, and I hope you just go, you always use those scriptures. Well, I always want you to know, Hebrews 4 says, you can run to Abba Fathers, jump, and he will catch you every time because of the blood of Jesus, because you've given your heart to Christ. You have a privilege. Romans 8, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing, not a zitch. What if I'm stinking and covered in sin? Best time to go to the presence of God. Lord, I don't know what to do with all this. Look what I walked into. Please help me. But the devil thinks, you know, why are you going to walk in like that? And all of a sudden, the blood of Jesus isn't enough because you think you have to clean off something that you stepped into and you have no ability on how to get it off. You run to the presence of God. The grain offering. Your reference, Leviticus 6, 14 to 23. And this is radical. Remember it says he gave a burnt offering and a grain offering. Dear one, simple. The grain offering is his tithe. Isn't that well? The guy gives a, a whole offering to the Lord and then he gives his first fruits of his crops in this whole thing. Matthew 6, 24 on the screen says this. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And I thought this was significant because some would argue when they read the scripture, no, this is not a tithe of grain offering. It's a different type. And I would strongly disagree because of the connection with the burnt offering. Because we're talking about being wholly pleasing to God. And the scripture says you cannot serve two masters. How can you be wholly pleasing if you're divided in two ways? Right? So I, I just submit to you that this is a tithe. All right? Then finally, the part in the scripture, where is it? In verse 19, but the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name, See it is, seeing it is wonderful? The cross reference for this verse is on the screen. The word wonderful is also used in Isaiah 9, 6. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his soldiers. Who are we talking about? Amen. Amen. And his name will be called Wonderful. Same name. This is the proof that this is not a messenger of God. This is God. God is in the house. He will be called wonderful. He goes, why do you ask my name? It is too wonderful. There it is. He said it before Isaiah wrote it. That is just too cool. Counsel, wonderful counselor, mighty God, eternal father, prince of peace. That is so awesome. Let's keep going. Verse 19. So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it on the rock to the Lord, and he performed wonders while Manoah and his wife looked on. Well, we'll talk about there's two things that happened there. For it came about when the flame went up from the altar toward heaven, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. When Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell on their faces to the ground. Now, there's two things that happen. And again, you've got to study the Hebrew in this. But when it says, when the flame went up from the altar, it literally means it spontaneously started. So we don't see that in the story. But God starts the fire. Okay, so all of a sudden they go, whoa. And then God ascends it. And they do a double whoa. And they fall on their faces and they go, oh my gosh. We've been in the presence of God. It's not an angel anymore. They realize that they've been in the presence of God. 21. Now the angel of the Lord did not appear to Manoah or his wife again. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. And he has a very righteous but wrong response. He says, we will surely die for we have seen God. Now, a lot of times we think that's the appropriate response. But remember, as Christians on this side of heaven, on this side in the New Testament, because of the presence of God, we are not to fear. 
to not look, to not to do this. I mean, there are some postures that sometimes when I'm worshiping, you know, I want to close my eyes, you know, and it's just like, or I want to bow down, or I feel these things. But in the presence of the Lord, in that off, incredible presence that God is, we are invited to look to him, to fix our eyes on him. And I, every time I think about that, I think of the privilege that none of these people in the Bible had but we walk in every single day. Read Hebrews 11. All those people that died not having an indwelling presence of God's, of the Lord like we do. They worked hard to the place that they said, well, someday in the future after Jesus comes, they're going to be indwelt with God. And for that, I am glad. Wow. But I love also that in the midst of this, that I, and, and this is a term that I, I learned in counseling on the mainland, that it's not just your eyes. What I really believe that God wants to do, dear ones, is he op- wants to open our heart eyes. You know, it's, it's one thing to intellectually know God. It's another thing to just get all feeling and just go all whatever's. But you wrestle with it here, you resonate with it here, and then something happens with the connect, and you begin to see. Remember in Luke on the way to, on the road to Emmaus? They, they, They were walking along just sorrowful because Jesus had died, and they couldn't find his body, and the two apostles, disciples are walking along, and Jesus walks among them, but they don't see him. And they walk and talk, and he, they have questions, and he begins to answer their questions. And finally, he, he, they get to the house, and he makes like he's going to leave, and they say, please stay a little longer. So they walk in, and it says that the moment that they broke bread, that their eyes were open, their heart eyes were open, and they go, oh, my gosh. And then he was gone. And then they said, didn't, didn't you feel that the whole time we're on the road? And they start talking about, yeah, I didn't want to say it, but, man, something was going on in me. Something, just this was more that this was a man. That it was Jesus. God wants you to resonate that way with Him. It's it's His presence. He wants you. It's not a mystery. He wants you to know His presence that way, right? Verse twenty-four. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed something. Look back at verse twenty-three. But his wife said to him, "If the Lord had desired to kill us." And she has such wisdom here. He would not have accepted a burnt offering. Remember the conditions of the burnt offering. You need to be invited and in good relationship. And whose idea was the burnt offering? You remember in the scripture? It was God's. If if you detain me, I'm not going to eat. But if you want to give a burnt offering, and that's the acceptance. You see that right there? And she caught it. Honey, you know what? He invited us to give this. We're okay. We're cool. And then she begins to put it all together and catch this because there's, the Bible says that we have the mind of Christ in 1 first first Corinthians. Is it 2? Okay, it is. And um, he would have accepted a burnt offering, a grain offering from her hands, nor would he have shown us all these things. God doesn't give you revelation to go, I'm going to show you something that you're never going to have. <laughs> How mean is that? Nor would he have let us hear things like this at this time. Verse 24, then the woman gave birth to a son and named him Samson, and the child grew up and the Lord blessed him, and the spirit of the Lord began to stir him in Mahanedan between Zorah and Eshtaol. Now, I love this because what I get from that, and I just grab this, when God says it, it happens. God's word. God says it, it happens. Manoah and his wife, we will find as we get into Samson's life next week, they determine themselves to parent well, and we begin to see spiritual opportunities for the young Samson, right? Because of these incredible parents. So we'll talk more about Samson. Well, let's wrap this up. What are a few takeaways? And again, when I do this, just so you know, this is, I'm just sharing with you stuff that I got out of it. Okay, and I know the Holy Spirit. This is not an exclu- um, What is that? An exclusive list. There's not only five things that you get, but I just want to tell you, as I was studying the last couple of days, the Lord just gave me these five gems that I was kind of enjoying after. Number one, this is the first one that the Lord gave me, and I love Colossians 1:16. The idea is, dear ones, God has a plan and a purpose for your life. Look at this scripture. 
for everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. How heavy is that? And I love this because when I look at this couple, what a desperate dark time. Judge after judge after judge, there's a cycle where people, they get rescued, they get into idolatry. God sends a tribe to, to, to break their heart, in a sense, not to break their spirit, but to get them to a soft place again. And this is a time where in the midst of all the suffering, people are not calling out to God. But not all people, because this couple is. And I want to encourage you. Maybe you're in a place where, you know, it's just like you're the only ones in your family or the only ones in your workplace or on your sports team or in your neighborhood. But, and you may say, gosh, Lord, I'm such in a dark place. Don't stop calling on God. Why? Because he sees you. And the people around don't have the privilege of changing God's plan for your life. Will you receive that? No one has the privilege of changing the plan, God's plan for your life. Number two. Here's this term that my staff and I were just working on our team. Hold on to an unanxious presence. And here's a scripture that carried me through a year of counseling on the mainland. God will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed or steadfast on him because he trusts in him. Isaiah 26, verse 3. No matter what happens, God will keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed, who's steadfast on him. Why? Because I will trust you. Not the bum, 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 bum feeling. Not the logic of everything that's going on. Sometimes God defies logic and every emotion. You just go with him because it's right. And you'll think and feel about it later. You just do the right thing. That is what carried me through my time. I learned this thing because I was talking to one of my counselors the other day, and, and he said, he goes, he goes, John, he goes, you have such an unanxious presence. I said, that sounds cool. What is it? And then we spent the next couple hours on the phone talking about what it is, and I shared it with my team because it's so cool. It is so cool. Why? You're telling to the devil and everybody else, you don't have a right to mess with my relationship with my Lord. You don't have a right to bring freaky things that make me question his love for me or his call for my life. And I'm tired of playing your game. I am just so sick of it. Get behind me, Satan. I will worship the Lord. Oh, but a lot of stuff's going on. You know what? God knows the details. I'll be responsible right now. I just need to sing his praises. Why? Because that stuff is too loud and I can't stand it. I swim um, five days a week now because of, um, I have a, a heart that um, the Lord's working on. Um, I have knees that don't work anymore, so um, I'm not as bad as wax, you know. It's just like, um, and I'm not saying that negatively, but wax, man, that guy's falling apart, bro. Metal detector, beep, 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 beep. Every part of him, it just beeps. And I'm just like, bro, I don't beep. But I, I kind of bonk, though. And um, but I swim, and, and I, I love it because in the middle of my day, and I, I highly encourage you to have some place where you go where no one can mess with you, where no phone can go. I get in the water, and I fix my eyes. I swim in a pool on a blue line, and for 30, 40, sometimes 50 minutes, I just go back and forth, and I just worship the Lord. I'll tell you what, devil tries to steal your time. Y'all know this. You athletes know this. A million things start coming in your mind and everything going, and you know what you do? Don't make like, oh, I cannot. I shouldn't do that. Just say, Lord, I don't know what to do with this thought. I don't know what's going on, but you know what? Um, help me to fix my eyes on you, and I begin to sing his praises, sing in the spirit, do things. I got the water. The guys that are there, the lifeguards are Christians, so I know he's praying over me. Part he's praying, he says, please don't let him die in my pool. And, um, <laughs> but I have a lot of good friends in Kapolei, but this one guy, Greg, you know, he and I talk, he goes, how was it? He goes, he goes, wow, bro. He goes, you look so peaceful in there. I said, great. And sometimes he tells me, he goes, you weren't swimming right. something on your mind, and we'll sit there and we'll pray together after. I said, there's some things. He goes, get back in there, swim some more. And I do. It's fun to have people that are looking out for your tail in Jesus' name. You know what I mean? An unanxious presence. Number three, I learned that don't let the world deter you. Take heart. And we love this scripture at One Love, right? In this world, you have many troubles, John 16, 33, but what? Take heart. Why? Not I, me, but Jesus has overcome the world. And, you know, he's done it already. The world's been overcome. We just ride on his coattails. That's a great thing. Amen. Number four, 
It's 2 Timothy 2, 20 and 21. And it's a call, dear ones, to live a sanctified life. We, we don't have to grow long hair or, you know, not eat of the vine or do things. But we, the Bible says, now in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and of earthenware, some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for what? For honor, sanctified, useful to the master, and prepared for every good work. Isn't that a great description? I can use him. I can use this. Some of you have stuff that you never throw away because you go, I can use this, and other people don't see a value. You go, no, this is sanctified unto me. This is mine. This is mine, right? And it's just like um, I have a pair of goggles that make my eyes like raccoons, and I'm just having a hard time. And it's not because I'm Pake, even though I'm small kind Pake. But I just love these goggles because um, I swim so much, and I found these really cool ones. And they're starting to crack, and I just... I, you know, I can't put glue because it'll go in my eye, but I just, I just pray, hand, I lay hands on my goggles and I say, pray for me, pray for me. I just say, God, just preserve these because I, I'm just really used to them. They're sanctified unto me, but my wife has spoken to me and they are going. <laughs> I'm going, but that's okay. They will, the new ones will be sanctified unto me. Be someone. Let this be on your tombstone. He or she was a vessel of honor sanctified and useful to God, prepared for every good work. Isn't that heavy? Wow. Then I love this, and we'll end with this. Romans 4, 20 to 21. Dear ones, God keeps his promises. You just got to be persuaded. There's an old song, I'm persuaded he is able to keep. Yeah? I don't know if you remember that. I don't know who sang it, but he was cool. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith, and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. Manoah and his wife, they were persuaded. Persuaded to what? Live in a place that everybody else left. Persuaded to what? Believe. Believe that God has spoken to them. So when they prayed, they didn't say for confirmation if it's true. They said, we just want to know so we can do it right. That is so awesome. And then in the midst of it, when they get there, they're full of honor and everything else. And when they discover that God has been in their midst, he freaks a little, but then he trusts his wife because he says, you know what, baby? God is able to do what he has promised. And it's so awesome because she assures her husband and says, we're not going to die. Why? Because he told us stuff and he showed us stuff and he gave his approval to us. He's on our side. And what does it say? She gave birth and she, they made a decision as to how they would live their life. So as we end tonight, I just ask now, just give a moment. Just give a moment right now. We're going to pause for 20 seconds. Just let the Holy Spirit grab your heart before I pray. Go ahead.